Ontario went from zero cannabis stores to almost 1,500 in just over three years. In some neighborhoods, there are two or three or more just a few blocks apart. It's got people talking about oversaturation and a correction in the retailing of pot. With us now to explain, Mitchell Osak, president of Quanta Consulting, which specializes in the cannabis and psychedelic industry. Hi, it's so nice to meet you. Great to be here. Well, um, from your perspective, how has the Ontario government handled the retail rollout of cannabis? Um, it's been the best of times and it's the worst of times. The worst of times was the beginning of the rollout where the AGCO, which is the uh, federal department, uh, rather the provincial department responsible for awarding the licenses, was very slow off the mark because they weren't prepared for legalization. And at that point, they didn't have a lot of resources and manpower to be able to start awarding licenses. They quickly ramped up to the point where they've been giving out many, many licenses to many, many operators. So we've basically seen a hockey stick of license approvals, very slow at the beginning and then shooting up in the last year or so. Well, you know, before we started taping, we were talking about something really, I think, which is really interesting to understand in this space, the different players of this new world that we're in. Can you give us just a quick overview of that? So this Greek drama has three major villains, so to speak. You have... Uh, the government, which we just spoke about, and it's various levels of government that have contributed to the problem, but also created the right regulatory framework for an industry to germinate. And that's the federal and provincial government. Yes, mm -hmm. and municipal. And, you know, they're not uh, missing in action mm -hmm. when it comes to the cannabis industry. Then you have what's called the licensed producers. Those are the suppliers of cannabis products, whether it's flour or pre-roll or edibles. And they've also played a major role in the growth and the challenges of the industry. And then the third major villain is the illicit market, or the folks who were in cannabis before legalization, growing and selling cannabis products to consumers. So would you say that things have not gone well overall because of so many different players in this? Um, it's been a mixed bag of success. In Canada, uh, cannabis sales, legal sales are growing very quickly. We're expected to reach about $4 billion Canadian in sales by the end of 2022. And that's only after four years, essentially, of legalization. That's the good news. The other good news is that no one has died from the consumption of cannabis and the uh, illicit economy as a percentage of total cannabis sales in Canada as well as in Ontario, is roughly 50% of the sales. So we're making amazing headway. The problem in the industry is that the licensed producers or the suppliers are struggling with profitab profitability. And that's created a real issue, both from a you know, uh, job security perspective from employees, as well as shareholder returns for the investors. Well, if people are, uh, if the numbers are going up for people using, why are they struggling? Because the federal government has awarded so many licenses. I think the, the amount now is close to 800. There's too much competition. There's too many Provincial growers. Provincial government? The federal government. Okay. So the federal government, Health Canada, is responsible for awarding cultivation and processing licenses to operators. And they've awarded roughly about 800 across Canada. Mm -hmm. Those producers have dumped and grown and dumped a heck of a lot of cannabis product on the market, which is depressed prices. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, um, you have a situation where the illegal economy is still there and they've also dropped their prices. So you have falling prices, which is very good for consumers, but not very good for operators and investors. So who operates the retail space? Is it the pro uh, provincial government? In Ontario, are, it, it is private sector based. So you have entrepreneurs, you have chains that are based in Ontario and based elsewhere who are running stores. Well, you know, you mentioned that in the last four years, it has gone up. What role did the pandemic play in that? The data is sketchy, but it directionally it looks like cannabis consumption went up during COVID, and that traces to a lot of factors. One thing we've seen with alcohol and gambling, for example, is that in very difficult times, those consumption of those products stay the same or go up. We saw the same effect with cannabis. You know, during the we were talking before that we started taping of I moved during the pandemic, and unfortunately, like every other neighborhood, a lot of the businesses were shut down. But since then, well, we have two, three shops. Um, what are the rules around that? Where these shops can be? Because I also see them in the malls. Is that part of the problem? Um, the retail landscape in Ontario is like a big piece of Swiss cheese. <laughs> There are 
pockets. Where By the way, I love these analogies. Uh, <laughs> well, I can't think of a better one. You have lots of um, areas where you're not allowed to have cannabis stores, and those are primarily within 500 feet of a school or a daycare center. So if, if a school can see a cannabis store, there's no way the AGCO will allow that store to open. You have other areas, like in the malls, where you're not near any schools. And because of that, you tend to get a lot of clustering of stores in particular parts of, of Toronto as well as other municipalities. And that's why in places like Queen Street and Dundas and Avenue Road where I live, you have lots of stores. And in other areas, you have no stores. Like Mississauga, right? Yeah. Um, about 66 municipalities have opted out of allowing cannabis stores within their legal boundaries. So Mississauga, Vaughan, Richmond Hill, Oakville, as well as probably 60 others, have not allowed cannabis stores to open. Well, you mentioned all the stakeholders that were at the table, and communities, I guess, is one of those stakeholders. Mm -hmm. um, these municipalities opting out, has that hurt the business, or has that helped? The question is, hurt whom and helped whom? Mm -hmm. It certainly hurt the, the health of the retail sector in general, because if you can't be in Mississauga, you're going to cluster in Toronto. But is that good for business to have so many people? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But th what's happening in Mississauga is that those citizens are either going and buying in the illicit economy, which is still flourishing in Ontario, you know, roughly 50% of the sales mm -hmm. still go in the illicit economy, or those people are driving into Ontario or other municipalities where you're allowed to buy legal cannabis. What about smaller towns? Same story. Mm -hmm. um, these 66 municipalities are across the province. They're not just in the GTA area. Well, you know, when the Tory government came in, it stated that they wanted a free enterprise was the way to go mm -hmm. to approach uh, the rollout for retail uh, cannabis, but uh, not have government control like the Liberal government wanted to do the LCBO model. Um, does the province have a more free market now? It does. The problem is that the, the Ford government, and, and this has happened in almost every other province in Canada, still authorizes a monopolistic wholesaler which is called the Ontario Cannabis Store in Ontario. So you have one person you can go to get all this cannabis? Correct. And the Ontario Cannabis Store um, sells to all the retailers and all the licensed producers have to sell to them. So they are a master distributor. But at the same point, they can also sell direct only online to, con to Ontario consumers. So they're playing both roles. And, you know, arguably, if you talk to a lot of retailers, they're not happy having to deal with the Ontario Cannabis Store. Well, why? Uh, for one thing, markups. Um, the OCS marks up products anywhere from, say, 40 to 60 to 70 percent. That's number one. Mm -hmm. So consumers and retailers are paying a higher margin than they normally would from buying from through the Ontario Cannabis Store. And number two, the OCS has had some operational challenges. You know, this is all public knowledge, but there was a re recent cyber attack in August where the OCS suspended deliveries to retail stores and then limited the, 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 those deliveries to retail stores. So it hasn't always been easy for retailers in Ontario. Oh, you know, we there's no one here from the government, but I'm guessing, and I don't really know this space very well, so correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. I, I'm guessing maybe the OCS is, you know, their position is that uh, having one place where everybody can go makes it fair and also safe. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that a reasonable argument? It's more than a reasonable argument. A lot of licensed producers only want to sell and collect money from one buyer, mm -hmm. and that's the OCS. So the licensed producers, in many cases, like dealing with a single government body, like the LCBO, because their business is much simpler. So if I'm growing cannabis, say, in Manitoba, and I want to sell to Ontario retailers, I just have to deal with the OCS, I just have to ship to them, and they fulfill or distribute to all the retailers in Ontario. So for licensed producers, it's not a bad deal, and that model makes a lot of sense from an economic perspective as well. Well, um, do you think the government should have gone the way the Liberal government wanted to with the LCBO model? Um, that is a, uh, a difficult question to unpack simply because it's part politics and we know, it, you know, when it comes to these types of products, politics are important, but it's also part resourcing and, and taxation. There are two major models in Canada, and I'll quickly um, summarize them. You have Saskatchewan, where you have no government wholesaler and it's all in the private sector. They take a much smaller markup. And to a certain extent, that's better for consumers and better for licensed producers. Why? Because the prices are lower. 
because and it's because it's easier to deal with the illicit market. So when the prices are lower, people have less incentive to go to a dealer to buy their because product. Because the dealers are cheaper. Right. In Ontario, where you have those significant markups, it becomes more expensive to consumers. And that value proposition of, of being in the legal market becomes a lot lower than it is going to your old buddy who used to sell you weed for a lot lower price. And sell it, by the way, more conveniently, whenever you want, in a backpack, when you could sample it. Any other jurisdictions doing it right? Um, it, it, the question is how right is right. I don't think anybody's doing it really wrong. And I don't want to dump all over the OCS because, as I mentioned before, there is a lot of value there, and they do a terrific job of educating consumers. I think the province that does it the worst is Quebec. What Quebec does is limit the number of stores. They, You know, for a province that has roughly 20 to 25% of the Canadian population, mm -hmm. they have 100 stores. For perspective... Toronto has 450 stores. Wow. So Toronto, which is smaller than the province of Quebec, has four and a half times more stores. Quebec also limits edible sales. They have a higher um, age of majority than we do in Ontario. So the Quebec market is much more restrictive. And consequently, I don't think it's doing its best to combat the black market, which is what we're doing in Ontario reasonably well. And what are edibles, just in case some people don't know? They're, they're gummies, they're cannabis beverages, they're, they're brownies, they're anything that is consumed not through a combustible process. Well, you know, we're all right, the pandemic is still here. A lot of businesses are still struggling to get up from the ground. Uh, what would you suggest the government here in this province can do to make the situation a bit more equitable? Um, for one thing, excise and federal taxes are extremely high in cannabis uh, to the point where... Um, and I don't want to get into a whole conversation and bore your um, your viewers on taxation. <laughs> we like nerdy policy. stuff. <laughs> yeah. Let's just say taxes make up roughly 25 to 35% of the total cost of goods sold. Wow. Of, of, of a gram of flour. Oh. And that's a big problem. So the money that should be going to lower either lower costs for consumers, higher wages, re a research and development or what have you, is going to government coffers. And that's a problem for the industry mm -hmm. because the industry is being starved of the capital and profits it needs to, th it needs to thrive. What, what other solutions can we come up with? Um, there's a couple of things. Um, if you look at uh, THC limits, <clears throat> excuse me, on edibles, you're limited to 10 milligrams per... What is that, THC? THC. Mm -hmm. That's the psychoactive that makes you high or makes you happy. Mm -hmm. um, you're limited to 10 milligrams per, per unit. In places like California, you can get a brownie with 100 milligrams of THC or 150. Even in the illicit market in Ontario, you can get that. So those potency limits continue to drive consumers into the illicit economy because they can't get the assortment they need to be able to get in, in things like edibles here. The third area where it's a big issue is in terms of how do you brand or what can you say about the product? You know, we know we, we may hate advertising, but advertising educates us and it tells us what the value of particular products are. Health Canada has serious restrictions around what you can say about cannabis, what you can put on a package, and that reduces consumer education and as well drives people into the illicit market because your dealer, your buddy will show up and tell you what the psychoactive effects of this particular flower will be for you. I wonder though, because this is such a new space for everybody, mm -hmm. you were talking about the potent, potency. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that maybe uh, some of these restrictions are in place just because of the safety aspect? You said that no one's been hurt so far from cannabis use uh, since the rollout. Mm -hmm. So do you think maybe there's a little, there's still a bit of like growing pains around this industry? Uh, excellent observation. Um, absolutely growing pains. It's still early. It took Amazon 15 to 20 years to make money. Mm -hmm. So the fact that a lot of licensed producers aren't making money, we shouldn't be too concerned about it. The problem is that many of them are in danger of failing. So to the extent that it's, we're still in the first period of this hockey game, absolutely. Companies are getting better. Products are getting better. The One of the express objectives of, a, of cannabis legalization by the federal government when it came out was health and safety and reasonable consumption. And those objectives have been met by and large in spades. The challenge now is to loosen them up a little bit. We were very successful early on, and most sensible, reasonable people, including almost everybody in the industry, wanted sensible regulations that erred on the side of caution. We're almost four years into it. 
You know, it's time to loosen it up. It's time to let companies compete a little bit better. And it's time to give consumers more choice and lower prices. Maybe take the training wheels off a little bit. Yes. Yeah, so you know, I'm not a big believer in the nanny state. You know, if you look at the, you know, cannabis versus alcohol, cannabis from a social policy perspective. When you look at dip, drinking and driving, domestic abuse, violence, cannabis is much more benign than alcohol. Yet you have much you know, more liberal marketing rules around alcohol and sponsorship and so on and so forth. You don't have that in Canada. You know, when I was in university where, you know, a lot of people do a lot of experimenting, I never thought that I would be on a television show talking about uh, cannabis being legal. So mm -hmm. baby steps, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, Mitchell, thank you so much for helping us understand this uh, complex issue. We appreciate your insights. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.